What? Pikachu's coming back in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet? I can't believe it. It seems like Game Freak never gives this guy enough attention. It almost seems like Generation 9 was announced too soon. I don't feel like the games were rushed in any way. I mean, graphically, it looks like they've jumped a ton, even from Legends Arceus. And for those pointing out the backgrounds, just remember the disparity between the announcements of Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and Legends Arceus, and their actual releases. I'm sure the games won't look like Mario Odyssey or Breath of the Wild, but this is still a big step in the right direction. What I mean to say when I feel like it's too soon is that I feel like they could have done so much more with Galar, and I felt the same way about the Kalos region. They built these great regions and had stories and characters with so much potential, but they were quickly swept under the rug by games that people seem to enjoy much more, unless you're IGN. But that doesn't mean I'm not excited. In fact, I already love the direction that this game is taking. So many people were speculating a region based on India, or Australia, or Africa, but Spain and Portugal really came out of left field. And yet, to me, they fit. Sure, there's been a lot of Europe favoritism from Game Freak the past few years, but I like that they're fleshing out an entire Pokemon continent. I just hope that next time we get something like the aforementioned India or Australia, or even Texas or Florida. But the region looks beautiful, and I'm really excited to explore it. And that I certainly will be able to do, because this is set to be the first truly open-world Pokemon game after Legends Arceus made huge steps in that direction. Legends was open world in a sense, but similar to Mario 64 or Odyssey, where you explored open areas that were connected by a hub world. The website for Scarlet and Violet confirms that the game will have towns and routes that are seamlessly connected, more like Breath of the Wild than Mario Odyssey. I loved Legends for giving us a sense of what open world Pokemon would feel like, but this will really give us a baseline of what to expect in future titles in the series. Now, there are so many things I'd like to talk about in terms of what's confirmed, what isn't, what I'd love to see come back, and what I think can stay in the past games. But first off are our new starters, and I absolutely adore all of them. My favorite is the spicy crocodile, the bubble bobble protagonist himself, Wei Coco. He's just so cute and laid back and happy, and I'm hoping he evolves into a uh, fire and poison type, but there is so much potential for fire and grass, fire ghost, fire dark, there are so many combinations this guy could have when he evolves, and I love him. I can't wait to have him on my team. Sprigatito is cool. Right now, he just comes off as a grass-type Litten, so I hope to see some differentiation once they reveal these starters' evolutions. But I've begun theorycrafting evolutions for these guys, and I just couldn't help but take a support role similar to Incineroar for his evolution. And I think it would be pretty toxic if I got my prediction right. And Quaxley is by far the best name of the three. And again, he's absolutely adorable. I love his hat. The memes and images people are sharing on social media are absolutely adorable. It isn't often that I absolutely love all three starters. In fact, the only time I can actually remember is the Alola region. And even then, I've grown to dislike Incineroar thanks to playing BGC for so many years. But I will 100% be playing through the game with all three starters at least once. And I do plan on getting both games, as I've done with every new pair of titles since Black and White. I'll livestream one playthrough during launch weekend and then play the other game at my own pace. Another thing that stood out to me, I already mentioned it, is the graphics, specifically how the Pokemon look. I mean, Seviper has scales, Magnemite looks like he's made of metal, Lucario looks fuzzy. Game Freak is really trying to redeem themselves for the criticism they've taken in the past. And regardless of whether they look as good as Breath of the Wild or not, you have to give them some credit, because they're a much smaller company than Nintendo itself, and they're usually working on at least three games at once. I mean, in the past year, they've probably been working on Legends, helping with Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl, Scarlet and Violet, and whatever game is planned for next year. So that's a lot of projects to be working on at once. And another thing about the Pokémon we'll be finding in the game, Hisuian forms are returning, or at least some of them are. It's cool that they're not going to be Legends exclusive anymore. I just hope that we'll be seeing a lot of them. So far, we've only seen Hisuian Zoroark in a screenshot of a trainer battle. And I'm just glad we'll be able to use these Pokemon in a more traditional Pokemon game. Now, whether we'll get them exclusively through home support or natively has yet to be seen. 
All I'm saying is that we haven't seen Univan Zoroark or Lilligant in-game yet. That also brings me to the question of whether we'll be getting new regional variants this time around, and I'd certainly hope so, because those have been one of the consistently best mechanics Game Freak's come up with in a long time, and one of the only mechanics that they've really expanded upon in multiple generations. This time, I'd love to see the focus brought more so to recent Pokémon that get underappreciated, like Pyroar, or Copper Raja, Heliolisk, and so on, with a few older Pokémon like maybe Venom Moth or Tauros sprinkled in for good measure. I'd also love for these games to be treated as a soft reboot for the series, much like Black and White were. Obviously, it wouldn't be as drastic, because we've already seen that past Pokémon will play a major role in the region's ecosystem, unlike Black and White. But what I mean is that Black and White did take huge risks in introducing a large number of Pokémon, larger than any generation before or since, a new battle type, and put a big emphasis on deeper story and more fleshed out characters. And when the games were faced with huge amounts of backlash from the fans, Game Freak resorted to pandering to nostalgia, making the Kanto starters extremely important to Generation 6, and introducing Mega Evolutions, which gave new forms to fan-favorite Pokémon, specifically a lot of the original 151. Regional variants are also an extension of this, but I feel like they're more natural of an evolution of Pokémon as a whole, and less intrusive to gameplay. Mega Evolutions were also the first major gimmick that Game Freak introduced to shake up the battle system. These gave certain Pokémon, as I mentioned, new forms that heavily boosted their stats. They were followed by Z-moves, which could be used once per battle to power up an attack, and Dynamax, which made attacks stronger and increased a Pokémon's HP for three turns. And finally, Legends Arceus gave us battle styles, which in my opinion are the most transformative of them all. These either power up attacks at the cost of speed or reduce damage while increasing speed. And I think that these work for a primarily single player campaign like Legends Arceus is. But for a more traditional title that will probably be getting the major focus of the competitive scene, I think think that it would not be fun at all, as people would probably just resort to repeatedly using agile style attacks. Doesn't sound fun to me at all. In fact, I'd really just be fine if all of these mechanics were left behind for good. I love each of them, especially Z-moves, but I think they've all been played out enough. But that said, I am certain the Game Freak will introduce a new gimmick to change up how the battles work, and I'm pretty sure that just from this first trailer, we can determine what that gimmick will be. Now, Mega Evolutions were focused on increasing a Pokémon's stats. Z-Moves boosted the power of attacks, and Dynamax was focused on increasing a Pokémon's longevity in battle. Looking at it from that standpoint, stats, moves, and HP, each mechanic was changed to try and impact battles in a different way, and logically I think the next step would be messing with either types or abilities. Now, in my free time, I've been tinkering around with ideas for my own fan-made region based around Australia, and I came up with a gimmick that I called Ability Sprigs, items that would give a Pokémon that held them a second ability. These would come in two forms, generic ones that would give less influential abilities to any Pokémon they're attached to, such as Frisk or Sniper. There would be others in on top of that, but those are just the two that I thought of. And there would also be ones that could be attached to specific Pokémon. For example, we could say the Raichu Sprig could give Raichu the ability a battery in addition to its regular ability. So having, say, Lightning Rod and Battery would make Raichu an extremely potent support Pokémon, especially for special attackers. I mean, in this current VGC season, if you were to give this item to Raichu, you could power up Kyogre's attacks and draw any electric attacks away from it. That would be absolutely insane. And it could be biased because I made it up myself, but while I absolutely love the idea and would love to see Game Freak mess around with how abilities work, because they are extremely impactful in-game, I don't think that this is going to be what we're getting. Instead, I think we're going to see Game Freak messing around with types. Now, the town that we were primarily shown in the trailer has a big fountain, and we were shown screenshots of it. It has a mural surrounding it of the symbols for each of the types. So I'm believing that the gimmick will have to do with types, and will most likely be held items that give a Pokémon a new type. 
And this could go really one of two ways. I don't think it would work like Z-Moves or Dynamax, where every Pokemon gets to participate, but specific Pokemon will get their own items as well. And that's for a couple of reasons, and I'll go over them after I go over the two ways I think it could go. The first type I think it could be is an item for every type. I think that they could go about it giving us 18 items that could be attached to a Pokemon, giving the Pokemon that holds it a new type. And this would result in a very chaotic metagame where you're trying to, in team preview, suss out which Pokemon has the item, what type they would be. I just don't think it would be particularly fun at all. And it would make something like the Frisk ability extremely important. The other way I think it could go is that you just get these items for specific Pokemon, much like Mega Evolutions, where, say, the Charizard item could give Charizard the Dragon type on top of its Fire and Flying type. Or you could give it, give, say, Krikatoon an item that we make Krikatoon something like Fairy in addition to Bug. Um, if it's this, I think this is a much less intrusive mechanic, and it could be really interesting to play out. I mean, people have been speculating about the three-type system for a long time, and I think maybe we're going to see Game Freak pull the trigger. Now, the only reason that I'd say we wouldn't get both is because if you do get both, A, you have that really chaotic metagame I was talking about, and B, it's really redundant, because then if you give Charizard its item, then it gets the Dragon type. If you give Charizard the Dragon item, it still becomes the Dragon type. There's a lot of redundancy there that I just don't think is necessary. The last thing I want to talk about is the story. And Black and White took huge risks with a narrative-driven game that was continued in the first true sequels in the series. After the criticism, Game Freak just resorted to simpler stories. Beat the gyms and beat the bad guys. No real subtlety or anything like that in the stories or the characters. And there are certain character arcs that have been really good, but nothing that's really super memorable to me other than maybe Hop's story in Sword and Shield. This time I'm hoping for a new narrative driven campaign and again Legends Arceus did push us in that direction but I had such high hopes for Sword and Shield and I can't help but have high hopes for this one too. Now I'd like to wait until we see more characters to really make a big prediction for the whole story but I do have some ideas for where it could go just floating around in my head that I do want to mention here. So, Sword and Shield brought us Pokemon as a major sporting event, and from what I understand, Spain is really big on sports, especially soccer, which was one of the more influential sports it seemed like when designing the Pokemon gyms, stadiums, and uniforms. So, I think that we could be seeing a return of Pokemon as a sport with you as a competitor. I also seem to believe that the protagonists of the game, they look like they're wearing school uniforms. So maybe we'll be competing with fellow classmates to win the Pokemon League, and perhaps we'll be traveling to the gyms independently of one another. And if the games are truly open world, it would be really cool if we could choose the order we fought the gyms in. And if we did that, maybe we'd be run in, able to run into these NPCs just independently of each other, which could even influence when you fight characters, what Pokemon they have, what levels they are, and maybe even their stories. Now, I'm not going to say that we're going to get a huge branching story with multiple endings and all this different stuff. But what I'm saying is there, there's a lot we could do here now that there's open world Pokemon, and now that we're looking at Pokemon as a sort of sport. I think it would be really interesting to see where this could go, and I don't want to make any big claims or predictions or anything right now. I'm just, these are just some guesses I have based on the information we have available. But yeah, Generation 9 is almost here, and I am super excited about it. Nintendo seems really committed to making sure that this is a big year for the company, and really, it seems like it could even surpass 2017 at this point in terms of how big the releases are. All we really need to seal the deal is either a new Mario platformer, or maybe a new entry in Wario Land or Donkey Kong Country. But I'm assuming we would have to wait until E3 to see if the, any of those are in the cards. But I'm just, I'm really looking forward to these games. I'm looking forward to making some theory crafting content for the new Pokemon. And 
I'm just, I'm really excited. I was not expecting Generation 9 this weekend, to be completely honest. I was expecting some more well, Let's Go Johto. I was expecting to leave that Pokemon Presents disappointed. But this is the most excited I've been for Pokemon in a long time, which, given that Legends Arceus is, I'd consider, one of the best games I've played in almost a decade, this is absolutely massive. So I'm really looking forward to talking more Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, and I will see you all next time.